Hello everybody, I'm Ryan, your instructor for the Understanding by Design workshop. Today we'll be going over stage two of the Understanding by Design document, which covers determining acceptable evidence. First section of our document will cover the performance tasks that we'll have planned for our students. These are more of a summative evaluation to help determine if students have reached mastery in the knowledge and skills that we have designated um, for our lesson. We'll also be covering other evidence um, where we will be using formative assessments throughout our lessons that we have planned for our unit to determine students' progress. And we'll also be covering how to create an in-depth grading rubric that we can use for our summative assessments. At the beginning of stage two of our Understanding by Design document, we'll begin by going over performance tasks. Our performance tasks are more complex assignments that we'll be giving students to help determine whether they have showed mastery in the subject matter that we're teaching them in our units. Our performance tasks should be more large sized assignments such as projects or presentations or essays that we have students complete via a evaluation rubric. Um, these performance tasks should help measure both the transfer goals and the meaning goals that we set for students in stage one. You'll notice here on the left side of the screen that we have codes for our transfer and meaning goals. When we wrote those goals in stage one, they had codes applied to them. So what you'll be doing is when you come up with your different performance tasks for your students to complete, you'll be writing the specific goals that match with those performance tasks over here on the left. That's to make sure that all the planning we did in stage one is being applied to our evaluations that we're coming up with right now. In the center, we have our specific performance tasks that we'll be coming up with. Again, these performance tasks should be higher order thinking assignments. Students should have to show creativity and intelligence. We should create assignments that allow students to be a little bit more flexible in maybe how they complete the assignment or how they can show us what they know. Again, these shouldn't be simple, multiple choice answer um, worksheets. These shouldn't really be assignments pulled straight out from the textbook. These um, performance tasks need to be uh, using higher order thinking skills. And then finally, over on the right, we have our evaluative criteria. Over here, we want to make sure that we are pointing out how students will be evaluated when uh, doing their performance tasks. When thinking of high order thinking performance tasks, it's a very good idea to create a grading rubric. These grading rubrics can be used by the teacher to help you um, understand how students specifically performed on these assessments and it also gives students a good framework to work with so that they understand exactly what's going to be expected of them. When creating our evaluative criteria we want to make sure we're using different facets of understanding with our students depending on what type of assignments they're going to be doing. Um, we might want students to explain uh, knowledge and information to us um, where they might have to draw inferences or express something in their own words. We may want students to interpret information. So maybe they take data and turn it into uh, information that they can present to somebody, or they can take uh, information and teach other students about it. We want students to be able to apply the information they learned and be able to use the skills they've acquired. How are they going to take this information and actually use it in possibly a real world situation. We want to be able to see how students can show their perspective. Can they see the big picture behind the lesson? Are they aware of different points of view? Are they able to keep themselves from showing any type of bias they might have towards the content? Depending on the type of lessons you're trying to teach in your unit, maybe students need to show empathy towards other people or groups. Um, are they able to understand what other people went through, um, how they suffered, or how they accomplished certain tasks? And finally, we want students to show self-knowledge. Um, can they reflect on the meaning of new experiences? Can they reflect upon what they learned 
and maybe understand why it's important or how it's going to be used. Following our performance task, we're going to be going over other evidence that we plan on using throughout our unit to determine students' progress and see how they are learning the content um, that we're covering in our day-to-day -day lessons. The type of assessments we'll be coming up for for the other evidence, these are more formative assessments. These are things that we're going to be uh, looking at to see how students are progressing. Specifically, these are smaller uh, um, activities and assignments we may came up, come up with. These could be maybe um, specific questions from a workbook that we might alter for students to be uh, more engaging. These could be smaller performance tasks or group, group work that students work on. This could be simple things like self-reflections that students might complete. Uh, other examples of good formative assessments could be entry and exit tickets to see what students know at the beginning and end of lessons to help kind of guide your lessons along and to see where you may need to recover certain material or focus on other areas. To start off with over on the left we have our desired results code. Again we're going to take those codes from our skill and transfer goals and we're going to put them here to see where they match up with um, our particular formative assessments that we're going to be having our students complete. Again, this is to make sure that we're guiding our lesson along with the knowledge that we've this knowledge and skills we've decided that students need to acquire throughout this lesson. In our other evidence section, we're going to be selecting the other assignments we plan on having students to complete throughout the lesson. Most of these will be formative assessments where we're using them to see how students are progressing. But one or two of these might be used as summative assessments, such as tests or quizzes, where we maybe use a few multiple choice answers, but we might also ask students to perform more complicated uh, tasks and, in the form of maybe short or extended response or uh, solving large form problems. Um, examples of types of activities students can be doing is prompting, maybe teacher observation or personal observation. These could be homework assignments, journals, um, and again, tests and quizzes for maybe more of a summative assessment that, that teachers can use um, to get more data. Finally, we have the other evidence evaluation criteria. Again, in, in this section, we're more so covering either small formative assessments or we're covering um, more simple summative assessments like tests and quizzes where we might be grading them more so on completing simpler problems or more of a wide variety of higher order thinking skill problems as opposed to having one large project to work on. Because of this we need to determine what an acceptable passing grade or score is for each of these assignments or, or how are we going to evaluate them. For example, on a test or quiz that we design as a summative assessment to end the, the unit, um, we need to determine an acceptable grade that students need to get on the test to show that they've reached a certain amount of knowledge or skill acquisition. Um, on other assignments, maybe such as observations, we just need to determine specifically what does the student know, what are they showing us they're capable of. You know, not necessarily every assignment that we do needs to be graded, but every assignment that we give students needs to have a purpose behind it, and it needs to have a way to show us um, students' understanding and skill acquisition. As a final piece for stage two, we have our grading rubric. This is a rubric that you'll want to create for any large projects or activities you plan on using as a form of summative assessment. Grading rubrics are a great tool for both teachers and students. They work very well for teachers because it allows us to create a grading criteria that really doesn't show bias um, towards any specific uh, student. If a student shows a certain ability in one area, that, one area that we come up with, then we're able to easily apply a grade and show them why it was that they received a certain score. 
Um, it's a great tool for students because grading rubrics can be used to help guide the work that they're doing. It allows them to understand what's expected of them and what all is going to have to be accomplished in order to show a certain level of understanding and skill acquisition. If we look at the left side of our grading rubric, we'll see that we're going to be selecting the criteria. Specifically, what are students going to have to do and what are we going to be looking at in terms of grading the students? Um, if we look at a simple type of assignment that we've all done before, such as like a research paper, we might select criteria like, are they showing um, an acceptable amount of knowledge in the content they're talking about? Um, we might and put in writing criteria in there, like are they uh, properly formatting their paper in MLA or APA format? Are they writing topic sentences and thesis statements? Are they using um, transition words and phrases in their writing? We might also select criteria like spelling and grammar and capitalization, punctuation, even though those types of things are skills that are not the main focus of our lesson. Maybe those are some of those basic skills that we knew students were going to be working on um, and um, we selected those in stage one. Once we select all the necessary criteria for our rubric, we're going to have to decide um, what's an acceptable amount of knowledge that students are going to be showing in each of these areas. You know, what would be considered an exemplary score? You know, what's an acceptable amount of, of information they're sharing with us in this research paper? What's, um, are they perfect in their spelling and their grammar? Are they writing topic sentences and thesis statements 100% uh, of the time? Uh, and then we'll go farther down the road. What's a sufficient amount? So maybe this isn't, maybe they weren't perfect in these areas, but they did very well. They, they showed um, an acceptable amount of mastery in these particular areas. Then we go to the needs revision. Um, maybe here they're not showing us that they have an acceptable amount of knowledge or skill acquisition in our criteria areas, um, but they're showing us something. They're showing us that, that they're along the road to understanding, but they're not at the level that, that we think is necessary. And then finally, um, where we have no evidence, you know, what we're seeing here is that students uh, really didn't accomplish anything in our particular criteria areas um, that we've identified. Maybe they didn't write a thesis statement. Maybe their, their paper wasn't about the topic they were writing about. Maybe it's riddled with spelling errors. Um, depending on the criteria that you pick, um, in order to select no evidence, they really have to show that they have no understanding of um, these particular areas in our rubric. And again, it's very important to share these rubrics with students um, before giving them the assignments that they're based on. It'd be a very good thing at the beginning of a unit to pass out the grading rubric for their um, project. Um, that the rubric's based on so that they can see exactly what's going to be expected of them um, at the end of the unit. Um, again, it's used as a great roadblock. It allows students to ask questions early if they're confused. Um, these aren't things that we want to be giving students um, right when they begin an assignment or even worse once the assignment's over. And again, we also want to make sure that we are very specific with expectations when we're creating these rubrics. We want to be very analytical. We want students to know if I do A, I will get this score. If I do B, I will get this score. Um, there shouldn't be any surprises um, for the students when working through a rubric. And just a final personal suggestion, it's always a very good idea at the end of a project to have students um, take, the, take a rubric that you give them and do a self-evaluation so that they have time to go through their own work and kind of see how they performed and give themselves their own personal grade. Um, it's a good way for students to do a little bit of self-reflection and maybe it's a last minute thing to help them revise and maybe fix certain errors that they find on their project.